Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our virtual brown bag lunch presentation on the regional freight land use study. My name is Jerry Bogaz. I'm an assistant director here at NIMTIC staff responsible for planning and program management. Uh, we have two presenters today. You have Jenny Golensky, who is the co-project manager for this study and who works in our Long Island City office, uh, will be one of the presenters. And uh, Chris Lamb from Cambridge Systematics, who is the um, consultant project manager for this study, uh, will be presenting from uh, his location. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the presentations. Uh, the lines will remain muted today. But the chat pod is available for questions and we do have staff monitoring the chat pod who will read any questions at the appropriate time. A little bit of context on this particular study. Uh, this actually was recommended in the uh, regional transportation plan that was adopted in 2017. Uh, it's not the current plan, which was adopted in 2021, uh, but the freight element of that previous plan had indicated uh, and recommended the, uh, the development of a regional freight land use study. And interestingly, at that time, it was mainly because of the loss of, of commercial land uses uh, in and around New York City, uh, commercial and industrial land uses, uh, particularly along the waterfront. Um, but now, uh, given the pandemic and the changes in, in business models that we'll hear about today, uh, that's probably changing, uh, and there are new patterns emerging uh, based on current conditions that are just as important as the patterns that uh, raise the additional concern and the impetus for this study. So uh, having said that, as a little bit of context for this study, I'd like to turn the presentation over to uh, Yevgeny Galinsky. And uh, Yev, I am going to advance the slides when you're ready, and uh, please begin. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, you can advance the slide. Jerry, thank you. So just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, this study is uh, structured more of as a survey or a snapshot of what's uh, been going on over the last, I would say two years to, and, and uh, we are on and the goal of, was more or less to inform what's going on now and potentially inform future work. As such, um, the, uh, the study objectives were to to look to describe um, land current land use throughout the area to map it and to characterize it what kind of warehouses are there what are the sizes where they're generally located to look at the market trends and uh, about what what's being built what's being developed look at the microeconomic and global drivers about affecting uh, um, the demand for 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 land here for freight uses and other localized factors. Now the other the other objective of the study is to develop a, a topology to kind of to try to characterize and standardize um, uh, land uses that for freight. Next slide, please. Now, the area of the study encompasses the New York City metropolitan uh, area planning or forum or shortly map forum. Um, and it encompasses all the MPOs and COGS uh, around New York City and Connecticut and parts of New Jersey. Uh, next slide. Now, what exactly as is uh, freight land use? In the course of the of the project, uh, the best answer that we came up with was to classify the freight land use into three broad categories based on the nature and the volume of the cargo flows. So. From left to right, we have uh, freight generating, which you, you would expect a lot of outbound and in, inbound cargo, multiple tractor trailers coming into a facility or a site, um, and 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 and, and um, uh, the location would be uh, doing some sort of processing or manufacturing of the cargo. Then you have freight handling, which is your main transportation hubs, uh, ports, airports, um, um, uh, trucking. Um, um, transfer stations and such. And the last is freight receiving, which would be uh, commercial office, res residential, institutional, some place where you would expect to receive one or two deliveries, uh, like, a, like a moving truck and a couple of um, postal deliveries, some you know, um, e-commerce coming in once a day or trash coming out. So sig significantly um, lower flows. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
in the in the in the preparation of the study, we went back and looked through um, what has been done in this sphere by both Nimtech and um, others within our general area and um, uh, the broader scientific community. We've looked at um, so the, for example, for 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 the for the studies that were done by Nimtech, we looked at. The multi-stack uh, truck rest and inventory terminal surveys that were done 20 years ago, and, uh, and, and we realized that mo most of the work that we've uh, that has been done is 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 has been done like, quite a long time ago. Need an update, and um, we okay, excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, and what we realized is that. In order to have to to make to be able to make recommendations for for changes within our current transportation system, we need a more recent and more detailed plans and knowledge about what what where the where where the freight facilities are in our area. Uh, next slide. So the outcome of the of the review is uh, we've, we've identified several market trends. We've had um, Freight sprawl that co coincided with you know, overall, you know, uh, suburbanization that was going on in, in the 80s, 90s, up to, up to the present, and then later on in the last um, 20 years, there's been a, there's more, been more of a concern of inner cities, uh, industrial real estate within the inner cities being converted to residential and other uses, and then with the e-commerce that's became more prevalent in the last 10, 12 years. We've seen a lot more interest in the redevelopment, redeve repurposing the, the manufacturing sites that in the inner cities back into commode, into distribution for e-commerce. And the, the common themes that we're seeing throughout the, the, the literature so far is that there needs to be better coordination uh, to, to between uh, um, Private and within government agencies, for 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 planning and for integration of uh, freight facilities in the in the planning documents, and that there is some disconnect with the between local and regional needs. And we also noticed some um, opportunities. For example, creation of logistics hubs and freight villages for, for this teacher basically. Um, Areas um, that are dedicated for to to freight, uh, you know, having a uh, a freight a freight facility such as a port or a tr uh, truck transfer station, and having um, industrial sites nearby, and also how to how do you make uh, freight as a good neighbor with with uh, with with traffic going through residential areas and causing um, potential and negative impacts. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, uh, I'm going to bring pass over to Chris to talk about some of the Freightland uses. Chris, you on? Not yet. Oh. All right. You're on now. Okay, Chris, we're not hearing you. So, you could hear me. There we go. Can, can, okay. You're good now. All right. All right. Great. Um, all right. So, um, thank you, Yev. Thank you, Jerry. And, and thank you, everybody on the line. Um, so, the literature review that Yev walked through kind of gave us a, a good initial foundation to see what's kind of been looked at. Um, with regards to freight land use and trends, um, you know, throughout this region and kind of bigger picture nationally. Um, but then we went, set out to gather some data um, and kind of look at patterns ourselves uh, throughout the region. Uh, so if we advance to the next slide. There we go. Um, so we reached out to uh, MPOs to uh, councils of government in Connecticut, 
Um, in some cases, we reached out to individual counties and other jurisdictions um, to gather uh, land use data that, that they have. Uh, some, of it have. some of them have it downloadable from their websites, as is the case with New York City, for example. Um, some we had to, to reach out to, to folks and request. Um, there were a few jurisdictions you can see there in kind of the northern part of the region uh, where, uh, where those data were not available from local uh, organizations. Um, but we wanted to piece together land use data and, uh, and try to find out where we have some of these freight land uses that you have defined a few slides ago um, existing throughout the region. Um, so again, we, we brought data together from a bunch of different jurisdictions that had a bunch of different land use classification schemes and definitions and, and standardized it as best we could um, to identify, uh, uh, you know, kind of major categories, residential, commercial, industrial, et cetera. Um, I think having this kind of in, in one geo database together uh, is kind of a, a great asset. Um, for, for a variety of planning activities um, that, that NIMTIC and its, its members are performing. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see where uh, the different uh, categories of freight land use that you have defined before uh, exist. So we'll start with freight generating land use, and that was defined as industrial and agricultural lands. So these are, these are lands that are generating a lot of outbound shipments. They're receiving inbound shipments too, um, but they're also generating a lot of outbound. Um, so we have a lot of uh, manufacturing and warehousing and distribution represented here, particularly in the polygons um, in kind of the urban and suburban areas. Um, when we get to some of the rural fringes of the, of the region, we have a lot of that warehousing and distribution as well. Um, but I'd say that a lot of the orange that you see in places like uh, Lehigh County, Pennsylvania, portions of western New Jersey and Orange County, New York, a lot of that is agricultural land. Uh, and again, that's generating outbound shipments. Um, but in some parts of the region, uh, agricultural land uh, can um, accommodate, or land that's zoned for agricultural can uh, accommodate light industrial uses, uh, such as warehousing. And we're seeing some warehousing development happening on formerly agricultural land uh, in, in a few parts uh, of the study area. Uh, so there is certainly a connection between those two types within the freight generating uh, land use category. If we go to the next slide, um, that will show us a map of the freight handling land uses. And that includes transportation, communication, utilities. Um, so these are, are lands that are used prim primarily in the um, transport or handling of of freight. So we have um, a lot of highways showing up here, rail lines, rail yards. Um, if, uh, if you look closely into the, the center of the map, you can see areas like um, the marine terminals of the Port of New York and New Jersey. Uh, you can see airports such as Newark Airport, uh, JFK Airport, MacArthur Airport, and others. Um, so these are a lot of the lands that are used, again, for the transportation and handling of freight. And then the next slide um, is much of everything else almost, it seems. Um, but we have uh, residential, commercial, and mixed use. Uh, these are the land uses where a lot of freight shipments are destined to. And certainly in the age of e-commerce, um, residential areas are receiving more and more uh, freight shipments. Uh, we're getting parcels delivered to our doorsteps every day. Um, and, uh, and commercial uh, includes office and, and retail, um, which they are receiving shipments um, of e-commerce orders, but also a lot of retail stores are receiving you know, truckloads or less than truckload shipments of things to, to stock on shelves. Um, so these are kind of the the places of ultimate destination for a lot of freight shipments, and they're scattered throughout um, the study area. Okay. All right, uh, next we conducted a, a market analysis, really looking primarily at the industrial real estate market um, and seeing, noting that um, a lot of trends in logistics and consumer demand are kind of shaping where warehousing and distribution centers are being developed throughout the region. 
uh, we wanted to look at some data um, to kind of show us what those trends are um, and kind of what's happening uh, throughout the region and in different portions of the region. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so our teammate, BJH Advisors, uh, performed analysis of data from CoStar um, to, uh, to, again, kind of perform this market analysis for industrial real estate. So if we break the region up into its, uh, into its components, there's a Pennsylvania portion consisting of um, the Lehigh Valley area. We have northern New Jersey. Uh, we have uh, several of the uh, council of government in Connecticut that are in our study area. And then we broke uh, the New York portions of the study area into New York City uh, and then the suburban counties, including Nassau, Suffolk, uh, but also including you know, Westchester, Rockland, Orange, et cetera. Um, so if we're looking at properties by size in each of these subregions, um, we can see that um, you know, in New York City, for example, 80% of the industrial properties um, are 100,000 square feet or, or smaller. Uh, so we tend to have smaller uh, industrial buildings in New York City. When we get to places like Pennsylvania, um, you know, it's, it's nearly 50% are larger than 100,000 square feet. So we have larger footprint facilities um, that have been developed in Pennsylvania and to an extent New Jersey as well. Um, Part of that has to do with what's on the next slide, and that is the vintage of the properties. Um, so we can see that in New York City, we have those smaller buildings, but nearly 90% of them uh, were built prior to 1975, They're, you know, nearly 50 years or older. Um, whereas in Pennsylvania, uh, nearly 50% of the facilities are, uh, have been built since 2020. Chris, we've lost uh, your sound again. Uh oh, that's no good. We can hear him uh, more. Should I switch back to computer audio? Yeah. All right. Why don't I try switching back? I'm still to not hearing audio. Him. Do you want to go switch your audio, perhaps, back to your computer? Yeah, I mean we're hearing him uh, more. Audience, give us a minute. <clears throat> okay. Um, I switched back to computer audio. Is that is that better? Fine from here, Chris. Okay. All right. We'll we'll keep rolling. Um, so as I was saying, um, the um, the the vintage uh, ha has a lot to do with that as well. We have in New York City again, uh, mostly properties built prior to 1975, uh, whereas in Pennsylvania. Uh, Nearly half of the inventory has been built within the past 20 years. Um, and uh, on the next slide, we can see that new inventory that's under construction uh, and proposed, um, we see that there's a lot of activity happening in that Lehigh Valley area. Uh, so it's certainly become a real hot spot in the region uh, in terms of development of industrial real estate. Uh, so Northampton and Lehigh counties together um, have nearly 40 buildings um, that are uh, under construction or proposed, at least as of last year, um, totaling almost uh, 15 million uh, square feet of new space. Um, but we also have uh, you know, Union County, New Jersey, Hudson County, New Jersey, Orange County, New York, um, lots of new development happening um, in, in quite a few different areas of the region. Um, so we see it's, it's kind of interesting looking at places like the Lehigh Valley, looking at um, Orange County, even Warren County showing up here with a, a few buildings in the Phillipsburg, uh, New Jersey area. Um, a lot of this development kind of continuing near the periphery of the region, uh, but also a lot of development and redevelopment of industrial space in um, kind of the more urban core portion of the region as well. And a lot of that is supporting e-commerce. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, so looking at trends and drivers, next slide. Um, so, and I think you have alluded to this as well because the, the literature review is pointing to, to to some conclusions to this effect that, you know, we've kind of gone through 
some different stages in, and, and of trends in industrial uh, and, and freight land use development in the region. So in the 1990s into the aughts, uh, we had a pattern of you know, large retail distribution centers. Um, so your big box retailers uh, would have you know, one or two distribution facilities that were enormous in size um, that would be feeding truckloads of deliveries to their retail stores over a large uh, service area. Um, for some retailers, that could be the entire country uh, or the Northeast or at least the metropolitan area. Um, and then in the urban area, uh, we saw um, a reduction in the industrial land inventory. So land that's zoned industrial in, in New York City, for example, uh, there is a decline in the acreage of land zoned for industrial. And we saw a repurposing of a lot of industrial lands uh, for residential mixed use and other, other uses so that kind of came off of the inventory. Um, next slide, please. Uh, more recently, uh, we see we still see a lot of those large e-commerce fulfillment uh, facilities, large retail uh, distribution center uh, facilities. Um, but a lot of those facilities uh, are are feeding a network of smaller distribution or fulfillment centers that are positioned closer to where consumers are. So you're not generating necessarily truckloads for delivery to stores over a large service area, you're trying to get, at least in the e-commerce model, you're trying to get product as close to uh, consumers as possible. And you're doing that through a distributed network of uh, distribution and fulfillment center facilities. Um, so we're seeing um, uh, lots of smaller footprint um, industrial buildings um, being built uh, or proposed in parts of New York City, uh, northern New Jersey, um, and, and closer to, to where population centers of consumers are located. Uh, next slide, please. Um, looking at market trends, and this is through 2020, um, you know, there may be some changes based on some of those proposed and under construction buildings that may change the direction of, of a few of these arrows, but if we look at uh, the counties in New York, the counties in Connecticut, uh, it's been relatively stable to even a slight, slight declining of uh, industrial square footage um, over the past 20 years, uh, whereas you've seen a considerable increase in places like New Jersey, over 6% increase over the past 20 years, and a 71% increase, albeit from a smaller starting point. Um, in, in the two Pennsylvania counties. Um, so again, that points to where there's been a lot of development over the past 20 years in portions of New Jersey and the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows this that growth um, kind of on a map uh, where we see that 60 to 80% growth in Northampton County, uh, Pennsylvania, which is part of the Lehigh Valley. Uh, but substantial growth in um, in quite a few other counties like Warren, uh, New Jersey, uh, several other New Jersey counties, um, you know, Middlesex, Somerset, et cetera, Orange County, New York. Um, and we've seen some declines in a few of the urbanized counties, um, the biggest decline being in the, in the county uh, of New York, which is Manhattan Island. Next slide, please. Did we skip one? There. Um, so next, we wanted to look at some macroeconomic and global drivers that are changing logistics patterns, changing business uh, decision making, and could, and either are now or could potentially in the future, um, uh, impact or influence uh, fr uh, freight land use, um, both where it's developed, the types of facilities that are developed um, throughout the region. Um, so, working with the steering committee for the study, we, we identified several um, trends to, to take closer looks at. Uh, one of those is growth in e-commerce. As I mentioned before, e-commerce uh, brings with it, um, you know, changes in logistics patterns, wanting to get product close to consumers. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen reports where compared to traditional retail, 
uh, e-commerce requires about three times the logistics space um, per dollar of sales than traditional retail. Again, because of that distributed uh, network of distribution. Um, so we've certainly seen a big increase uh, in the year of 2020 uh, in e-commerce sales, uh, a 32% growth in one quarter of 2020. Um, that growth rate has slowed quite a bit since 2021, um, but uh, but e-commerce has achieved uh, a, a substantially larger share of retail sales in the United States compared to prior to pandemic. Um, so we took a look at um, you know e-commerce potential futures. Uh, you know, is there a low growth scenario? Um, where e-commerce basically doubles its share of retail sales that it has now um, by the year 2050 um, versus a high growth scenario um, where more than half of retail sales are on e-commerce uh, by 2050. And, uh, and certainly there would be a lot more demand for uh, distribution and, and industrial real estate um, to accommodate that activity. Um, based upon the scenario. Uh, next slide. Um, we also looked at distributed manufacturing, and that refers to the potential for um, 3D printing um, to, uh, you know, to, to take a more prominent role in the manufacturing processes. Uh, and the land use implications for that um, are that if, um, we could have distributed manufacturing facilitating more onshore production. So goods that are presently manufactured, uh, you know, overseas uh, could potentially be made um, in the United States or in an apartment in Brooklyn. Um, distributed manufacturing could facilitate to that end a cottage industry of make at home parts and goods, um, or it could remain a relatively niche activity without much of a, a major impact on overall logistics patterns. Um, so I think the distinctions between these potential scenarios are that if distributed manufacturing were to uh, play a, a fairly prominent role in the manufacturing of spare parts and other, other things, um, that would require less robust of a logistics system in producing and, and and transporting those goods uh, overseas and across the country um, and be more focused on moving those raw materials uh, to, to where those uh, printers are, are located. Next slide, please. Uh, next, uh, we looked at climate change and we wanted to look at that those maps of freight land use and see how much of our freight land use uh, is, um, you know, impacted or, or likely to be impacted um, by flooding and by sea level rise. Um, so using the special flood hazard areas that are defined by FEMA, uh, we found that 9% of our freight generating land uses um, are in um, those flood hazard areas. 7% um, um, is of our freight receiving land is in a flood hazard area. Um, and that sea level rise, um, rising three to five feet um, by 20, by the year 2100 um, could impact, um, you know, a little over 1% of our freight generating lands uh, and 3% of our freight handling and receiving lands. Um, so what that means is that for uh, lands that are, are, you know, subject to these, uh, these hazards, um, there can either be a hardening or defense of those lands uh, to protect them uh, from the impacts of flooding, um, or there could be a retreat from some areas um, uh, where where that hardening isn't practical or or desired, um, and thus a relocation of of some facilities to other parts of the region that are that are less subject to those. Uh, next, please. Uh, we wanted, also wanted to look at population growth and distribution. So, uh, you know, how much population growth is happening in the region and where within the region is that population growth happening? 
Uh, we've gone through kind of shifting trends over the past several decades of more growth in the suburbs versus more growth near the urban core. Um, so, you know, what the future looks like in terms of population growth, does the population growth continue or should I say resume uh, in the urban core uh, versus shifting back toward um, suburban and rural areas that impacts where consumers are and with e-commerce wanting to be near consumers um, that can influence where fulfillment centers and other distribution facilities want to be located within the region. Um, we also considered the impacts of little to no population growth in the region. Um, so much of the uh, industrial real estate um, that we have here is to serve uh, a, a population center that's here. Um, but uh, you know, if, if for example we see a shift in population or, or more pronounced shift in population toward the south and the west of the country, um, that certainly has implications for um, you know where retailers want to have facilities located, um, and even for the function of our port, um, you know, serving a, a local consumer population versus potentially having more of a um, uh, emphasis on on hinterland. And, and moving product to other parts of the country. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then we also wanted to look at the potential for uh, clean freight uh, or electrified trucks um, that might have on land use. So NIMTIC recently uh, completed a, a, a clean freight corridors study that looked at a corridor level um, for the potential and needs uh, to, to facilitate um, transition in truck fuels from diesel to to cleaner uh, fuel sources or to electric power. Um, so there are certainly there are land use implications for that in that there would need to be fueling and, and charging facilities um, along uh, along highway corridors uh, throughout the region. Um, so we'd want to look at, uh, you know, if there's robust growth in electric or other alternative fueling option, um, you know, where where that charging capacity, where those facilities uh, may be located, um, you know, be it at, at rest areas or off highway uh, fueling and charging stations. So certainly land use implications there and their commercial properties um, that that may become uh, charging stations at some point in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the final task of the study um, was to identify uh, and describe a topology of freight land uses. Um, so this is taking, kind of getting beyond our three, you know, freight generating, freight handling, freight receiving, categories uh, and really identifying um, some more specific types of, uh, of, of, of or groupings of freight land use based upon common attributes and common impacts or potential impacts of the trends. Um, so next slide, please. So we identified several categories in this typology and this graphic is showing that they are located in different types of areas within the within the metropolitan region and beyond. Um, and to kind of illustrate that, we showed it on the uh, urban to rural transect that any urban planners in the room are, have, have certainly seen before. Um, so we've focused on, so freight handling centers such as, you know, rail yards, rail lines, highways, airports, seaports can certainly be located uh, in urban areas, in rural areas, and anywhere in between. So you can see that's kind of spanning across the transect. Uh, same with freight receiving land uses. There are residential areas, there are commercial buildings um, in rural areas, urban areas, and everything in between. Um, we did focus on kind of breaking out the freight generating uh, land uses and, and, and showing that there are some different patterns um, within within that category. Um, so we have kind of the large greenfield distribution centers. So big distribution facilities, you know, 500,000, a million or more square feet. Um, those have tended to be built 
in uh, rural areas or suburban areas, particularly near the fringes of the of the metropolitan region. So those big buildings in the Lehigh Valley, uh, for example, um, exit 8A uh, and exit 7A uh, along the New Jersey Turnpike, for example, uh, where you're seeing these really big buildings. Um, we see modernizing distribution clusters. Um, so these are, would be areas that have been industrial for some time, have had some, you know, warehousing, manufacturing buildings on them. Um, but those buildings are being uh, either redeveloped or repurposed um, and modernized uh, to meet the needs of, of modern distribution. So we have some examples of that in uh, in places like. Um, uh, Red Hook, uh, where we see some, you know, modern uh, or modernized buildings um, um, in areas where there you know, have long been uh, some industrial buildings. Uh, we have agricultural areas, uh, primarily in rural, the rural zone. We have legacy industrial and manufacturing clusters, um, and primarily in our urban areas. Um, against smaller footprint buildings, typically, uh, typically older vintage. Um, and then we have what we've called endangered freight land use areas. And these are some of the areas, uh, as I talked about earlier, where um, they may have been freight uh, generating facilities for, for decades, uh, but due to kind of the encroachment of other uses and repurposing it uh, and, and adaptation for non-freight uses, uh, that's putting some strain, putting some conflict, and and uh, and and may kind of wedge out some some of those free free uses. So uh, we've categorized those as endangered. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a little more detail, uh, a lot of words, um, but um, a little more of an explanation of those uh, categories that I just walked you all through. Uh, and with that, I will thank you and uh, turn it back over, I think, to Jerry at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you can hear me, right? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Chris and Yev. Um, Yev's uh, email is up here. If you have any questions after this presentation, you can uh, you can send them to him and he will follow up. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, a question. And then we're going to go to the chat pod to see if there are other questions from the audience for this presentation. Uh, Chris, I, you know, we've seen a lot in terms of the acceleration of e-commerce. Uh, there's been a general trend spanning 20 years, probably, in the growth of e-commerce. And, of course, the pandemic just blew that up uh, through the ceiling. And now we're seeing some moderation to that um, to that trend. But it, it's probably... All indications are that it will increase to some to some extent, um, and I'm wondering if the analysis shows that, um, given the needs, the land use needs for e-commerce to be effective and for delivery times to get to uh, really really tight uh, uh, de delivery margins, um, is there a time when the land use will no longer support the growth in e-commerce? Is that is that a possibility? given what we've seen in terms of the land uses that are necessary uh, to support uh, e-commerce on a large scale? That, that's a great question. Um, and so I think we have kind of near-term and long-term trends to look at when it comes to e-commerce specifically, um, in that the, the near-term trend is that, you know, we had that rapid growth during COVID um, and companies like Amazon um, sought to and actually did uh, double their uh, system of, of distribution centers over the course of less than two years um, to accommodate that. And to accommodate was expected to be kind of continued um, rapid, robust growth in that consumer demand. That consumer demand has been cooling a little bit um, recently. Um, and, you know, companies like Amazon, companies like Target, um, are are starting to express worry that maybe they've overextended themselves uh, and and have built a little too much to at least accommodate um, you know kind of near term uh, growth and demand. 
Um, but I would say kind of looking forward, you know, what, whatever the near term economic outlook is right now, uh, I would say looking long term, um, you know, e-commerce is here to stay. Um, I think it's it's reasonable to assume that uh, e-commerce is going to represent more and more, you know, kind of increasingly larger shares of overall retail sales in the United States. And that overall retail sales in the United States is going to continue to become a bigger pie. Um, when it comes to land use to accommodate it, yeah, e-commerce requires more space than typical uh, traditional retail, as I mentioned before. Because uh, you have that distribution distributed uh, uh, system of distribution centers, you also have to accommodate returns. You know, thirty percent of all e-commerce orders in the United States end up being returned, and you have to have a place for those returned shipments to go to and be processed. Um, but when it when it comes to the capacity of the region's land, um, you know, certainly we're seeing a lot of development happening. We're seeing a lot of, you know, on the periphery of the region, places like the Lehigh Valley uh, that I've talked about a lot today. Um, but we're seeing, you know, former, formerly agricultural land kind of turning into warehousing and distribution. Um, that may continue out there. That may continue in other parts of the region. Um, and, you know, what seemed like kind of a futuristic or really expensive and probably silly idea a few years ago, and that's multi-story warehousing in, in New York City, um, is it has happened in a couple of occasions and and may continue to happen. So I think it's it's you know to accommodate growing consumer demand, uh, there's probably a, a cost and a price incentive uh, or I shouldn't say incentive. There, it's probably worthwhile to a lot of retailers to pay higher costs to develop multi-story um, in places like New York City um, for the value of being able to serve their customers best. So I think we're likely going to see more of that um, and, and kind of trying to get more productivity out of the land that we do have. Great, thank you, Chris. Um... Stephanie, any uh, any questions in the chat pod? At the moment, no. Okay, I have a second question actually, um, but that's it. I only have two, so I hope somebody else asks a question. Um, so you know, you mentioned Chris the the um, the trend with the urban uses and the fact that you know uh, Manhattan has seen a decrease in in. Um, in commercial industrial land uses. Um, so how much of this would you say is due to market forces and how much of it is due to public policies? I mean, obviously use of the waterfront has changed in New York City and the policy towards use of the waterfront has changed. Um, is that is that the prime mover? Are market forces the prime mover? And how is that also happening in other parts of the region? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a I think it's a mix. I think I think both contribute to that. Um, Kind of on the policy side, sure, you know, we, we see kind of transitions of some of our waterfront areas um, to, you know, parks and recreational uses, residential mixed uses, things like that. Um, you know, that can, in some cases, make it more difficult for the remaining industrial uh, businesses to, to operate and, and they may want to go elsewhere. Um, but also, you know, we have in in places like manhattan and some other parts of new york city you know i mentioned uh according to the market data we were looking at you know we have buildings that are older vintage um so they don't have you know the high ceiling heights that modern distribution facilities want to have um you know refrigeration is tough in some of those buildings to provide the you know and that's that's an area of de growing demand for for food and other things that require refrigeration um and uh, and so you know a lot of a lot of older industrial buildings aren't necessarily well suited for kind of modern distribution needs, um, and so they could either be retrofitted and probably very expensively, uh, or they could be redeveloped into modern uh, distribution buildings or or repurposed for other uses. Um, and the industrial buildings that do have modern, you know features uh, be developed elsewhere. 
Great. Uh, and of course, you know, what, what we, we were seeing in the Lehigh Valley particularly was, um, you know, relatively cheap, uh, large tracts of agri formerly agricultural land being converted to um, these enormous distribution centers. And unfortunately, we don't have anyone from the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission on this uh, session today, but they could certainly give a chapter and verse of how that's been affecting them over the last 10 years, uh, maybe 15 years, and how it's transforming the Lehigh Valley in many ways. Um, so, you know, the, the availability of land does obviously play into this. And, uh, Jerry, we did get two chat questions that just came Great. through. Um, Go for it. The first one, uh, has anyone looked at the change in volumet volumetric size of actual products being shipped? Basically, like a shoebox size of boxes versus microwave oven size boxes. Yeah, um, so th that's something that a lot of retailers uh, have have been focused on for for a number of years, trying to get more efficient with packaging, um, so that you know you can fill more product into a warehouse shelf or into a truck, um, and so, you know, I, I think I think there have been a lot of advancements, if you want to call it that, in in packaging um, that you know kind of try to try to maximize that efficiency um, for 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 volume. Um, that said, I mean, I I do open up a large Amazon box to find a tiny thing that I ordered sometimes. Um, but I, I, I do think that that happens less and that, that will probably happen less, uh, going forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I think, you know, you're going to see retailers want to try to continue to squeeze out, uh, more capacity and more efficiency. Um, and I, I think package size is going to continue to be part of that. I mean, there's only so much smaller you can make it. Uh, and to, you know, before it's the size of the product itself, but, um, but if, if there's a will, there's a way, or if there's a way, there's a will. So. Thank you. If I may add. Go for it, Jeff. Okay. So another take on it from, uh, you know, from inside the freight and logistics industry, generally speaking, um, the size of the box isn't going to matter as much of how many boxes there are. So. If, if a retailer all, all of a sudden, you know, has an explosion in, uh, in demand of a particular product and they need a lot more space, they're going to go out and rent or have that uh, warehouse built. So we're, more of the volume of sales, it was going to determine um, the need for warehouses than the actual packaging. The packaging just oh, makes it easier to squeeze in slightly larger uh, amount of, of product into a particular facility, but if you have a huge increase in um, demand of a product, you're just going to have to get more facilities and vice versa. Yeah. If you have a decrease, then you need less. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Good point. Stephanie, you indicated there was a second question. It is a uh, much larger scale um, regarding industrial sites in general. Are there particular conditions on industrial sites? That make freight uses more likely. I mean, if you if you talk to you know um, site location consultants um, or industrial real estate pros, you know certainly some sites are more marketable um, than others uh, based upon uh, be it you know highway access. That's probably issue number one uh, for for most um, uh, industrial tenants or users. Um, so if, if you've got sites that have, you know, good highway access, uh, depending upon the commodity, rail access may be desired. Um, and, um, you know, if the site, you know, is flat, um, doesn't require a lot of preliminary cleanup um, and, uh, and, and has, you know, utility uh, hookups and everything, yeah, that that's kind of the dream site. Um, and if if a site is missing one or more of those attributes, it may still be worthwhile. Uh, it just may require a little bit more more work, and it would have to be you know kind of worth it in the, in the mind of the company that wants to be there. 
Chris, that description is interesting because again, you know, pointing at the Lehigh Valley, um, all three of those things are there. Um, it's agricultural land, so the topography is pretty flat. Um, it's it, the highway access is good. There are interstates in the area. There's some rail access. Then there's an airport um, that can handle shipments also. And all those things combined with uh, the relative cheapness of the land, it really created a, a situation that um, uh, exploded uh, in that area. So uh, I think that's a really good real world example. But in another question as well, um, a person who is interested in highway capacity requirements to support freight transport transport. And the question is going forward. Is there a possibility that self driving vehicles or other technologies might allow for reductions in highway capacity? Would it be possible to shift freight transport to nighttime hours when roadways are currently underused? If you have any other thoughts or analytic conclusions on the transportation network in relation to freight, I'm interested in hearing those as well. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to put in one, uh, one, uh, the, the item of, of, of the off hours delivery. New York City has been engaged in a, in a rapidly expanding pilot, uh, using in some cases federal funding to, uh, to test that. And, um, it would seem that from the distribution center perspective, it's, it's very doable. The issue is the, the destination. And uh, if you're going to deliver freight at three in the morning, the, you have to have people to offload the freight into the store or wherever it's going. Um, and and there's also the issue of noise associated with that at that time of the night. Those things are not insurmountable, but they're definitely factors that go into off hours delivery. But certainly the city has been looking at that um, rather intensively now for several years. Uh, Chris, do you, you want to say anything about the automation? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, self-driving vehicles um, certainly have the potential, uh, if they're adopted widespread, um, to um, to make highway operations more efficient. Um, and uh, could certainly kind of in, increase the capacity without expanding, you know, new lanes and things. Um, uh, of, of a highway facility, um, you know, there are some, some very real technical challenges, particularly in an urban in, environment um, to operating, uh, you know, autonomously. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're going to see autonomous trucks uh, on, you know, kind of long stretches of interstate highway um, first. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll probably see that efficiency improve, improvement on kind of the long haul portion of the truck trip. Um, I think that, you know, particularly for last mile distribution and delivery uh, in urban areas, there are a lot of other practical challenges that are going to have to uh, be overcome. We're going to have to figure out how to, you know, operate uh, autonomous trucks and cargo vans with autonomous cars. Um, you know, with pedestrians and bicycles and transit vehicles and everything else in, in an urban context. Um, so it, it would be great to, to get there and see it operate smoothly and seamlessly uh, and safely. Um, but I think that may take a while. And and I think one part of that, Chris, is also um, the rather long period of time you're going to have autonomous vehicles pro operating with uh, yes. vehicles Analog. operated by humans, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> which which presents its own uh, challenges. Uh, certainly, you can platoon automated trucks, but what does that do to the safety of, of a highway if there's a platoon of automated trucks moving at relatively high speeds? You know, so in in a mixed in a mixed traffic law. We have, have time, I think, question. for one more question. So yep, we just got one in. Oh, sorry, is there a verbal one? No, no, this is Evgeny. I just wanted to add a little bit more to the to the last, to the last question that was just asked. Um, as far as capacity of the of of, of the highways expansion the decrease, I think uh, if we you know the the question here is more along the lines of do you have more cargo or less cargo being transported in each in which way? So. If we're not, if we're, if we're to, let's say, keep the, try to keep the highway capacity so, so same, but, you know, we have to accommodate the 
additional cargo. You know, it can either shift to other modes of transportation, for example, by water or by rail. But if to do that, there needs to be improvements in efficiency of transferring, you know, from smaller boats to to shore in more places, or you you have a, an expansion improvement of the rail network where you, you can transfer that cargo from the highway to the, onto the rail, and you can do short distance uh, hauls, which are cost effective. Now, is, that, the other the other side of it is also okay. So, what, what if the distributed manufacturing picks up, and now you're transporting instead of finished products, you're transferring um, you're, you're transporting um, the raw materials necessary to manufacture those um, um, you know, those products locally, which may reduce the amount of trucks needed to to do the transportation because you know when you, it's it's like it, it takes a lot less space to transfer a liquid in in a, in a tanker versus uh finished boxes where that have a lot of you know wasted space between you know between boxes themselves and inside the packaging so you might need a little bit less truck trucks that way so that, that those are the only instances where you can avoid the expansion of highway capacity Thank you, Yev. Okay, so um, Stephanie, we yeah. have time for one, one more question. Yeah, if we can, if we have spit it in. Um, is there any movement on increasing freight rail capabilities to Long Island, such as the talked about rail freight tunnel to Brooklyn, or putting in rail across the new Tappan Zee Bridge? Okay, so from what from what we know, um, yeah, I, I can say that the the tunnel to uh, Brooklyn, uh, the Cross Harbor. Uh, goods movement effort is moving into a tier two EIS. So uh, there is not yet a preferred alternative for that. Certainly the, the tunnel option is still being looked at as part of that whole effort. And as everyone knows that that stretches back decades. Uh, so, yes, that is in fact still in in process, so to speak. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, any. Intention at this point to put rail on the. What, whatever they're calling the Tappan Zee Bridge now, uh, but you know it, it the the configuration of the bridge is such that uh, at least light rail for transit could be added, I believe, uh, in the future if if that the demand proved uh, sufficient to support that. Uh, in terms of you know heavy rail and freight rail, um, uh, that's not been mentioned uh, in in, uh, in in the recent development of the, of the bridge. Does someone else have a an answer? I thought I heard someone. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd say. I mean, I think there are kind of practical limitations to to putting freight rail on that bridge um, and just trying to get to, uh, you know, the river line and the Hudson line on either side um, from the bridge. Um, so I know that I think that was looked at as a potential alternative in the early stages of a cross harbor uh, analysis. Um, and was dismissed just because it, it, it just wasn't really feasible uh, from a, being able to connect to other freight rail lines. Well, that, yeah, the connection is, is in many cases, the, the, the sticking point. Uh, I know if you go back far enough in terms of the cross Harbor uh, alternatives analysis, and we're going back 20 years or more, um, it was also looked at, uh, or considered at some level. Uh, the possibility of uh, re-establishing freight service on the uh, what's now walkway over the Hudson, the the uh, Poughkeepsie Rail Bridge, and the issue there was not so much that you couldn't make the rail bridge, uh, you know, uh, except that you couldn't put rail freight back on the bridge. It was how do you get to the bridge in the first place, um, because those connecting lines no longer exist and. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but like the river line and so forth, the lines that are being used now are literally right on the river. So yeah. um, how you would get them up to any bridge uh, from that location is would be a, a huge engineering challenge, if nothing else. Yeah, and freight rail doesn't like more than a 1% grade. So right. that, that adds to the challenge. Uh, and then another thing on Long Island real quick, I mean, I, I know apart from a cross harbor tunnel, um, you know, there have been investments uh, made to to facilitate uh, more growth in rail uh, on Long Island. I know Brookhaven Rail Terminal has been part of that um, as a as a facility to receive uh, freight out on Long Island. Um, and although I don't have specific numbers, I know that, you know, the trend had been for a number of years uh, kind of growing rail freight volumes 
um, on uh, New York and Atlantic system. Yes, I don't have numbers either, but I know the trend has been upward um, for quite some time on New York and Atlantic. Um, so at this point, we're at one o'clock, which was our targeted endpoint. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your attention. I want to thank our presenters, Yev and Chris, uh, for an excellent uh, report on what was a, a multi-year effort to collect a lot of information with a lot of implications. And um, not only did we uh, learn from this study, but we also um, were uh, provided with basically a land use database that will continue to be used into the future and updated periodically for any number of, of, um, of reasons. Um, one of which will be continuing to monitor freight development in our region. So, um, so thank you both, and thanks everyone else in the audience for uh, for your time today. And um, yes, the question just came up about the slides. Uh, we will be posting the slides on our website in support uh, of, uh, not in support, but with the report on this particular um, session. So look in the next couple of weeks for something on our homepage reporting on the, this session. With that, thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon and uh, thanks for being with us. Well,